I'm going to turn it over to Gil um, to talk about the market background, um, which goes into our market uh, toolbox. Thank you, Mike. Any questions out there? The conference has been unmuted. So yeah, I guess before we get started, um, are there any quick questions uh, before we get into the, the background? <coughs> okay. So I, I will thank you, Mike. The for conference has been muted. I will just add one more thing about uh, Mike is talking about the tool, and what we mean by a tool is that we are not giving you a plan for any specific location. We actually have a plan, but it's just to demonstrate the tool. The idea is that anyone can download it or ask us to send the package and change the assumptions. It all change, you can change all the assumptions of the number of cars and, and the distribution and the cost and so on and run it for your location. It's preloaded with data on uh, California, so you don't need to collect data. You can just use the preloaded data on California. And if you want to dive if even deeper, you can change our scripts because also the scripts are open for, uh, for the public and we will be happy to uh, help and consult. So the idea is that we are not creating a rigid PDF that everyone uh, uh, can read one time and do nothing with it later, but we create something that you can uh, change, use, second guess our, our decisions on, on the different numbers and, and keep updating it in the future. We already know now more than what we knew when we program it in, and if we had a, if we need to update it for a specific location, we will probably already start tweaking with the original numbers. It's a continuous uh, 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 effort. So I will talk about the background market, and, and part of this uh, uh, of the issues that I will talk about in the market are not in the tool itself, but in the in the decision that you will have to make on what kind of default the tool will run on. For example, we are not going to tell you how many electric cars will be in the state of California in 2020. That's a decision you will have to make, and then put it into our, uh, into our tool and click enter and run it. But we are not going to guess or to forecast or any way, other way you want to call it on how many cars will be here in every year, but we're going to help you uh, come up with your number. So the, the PV market is changing fast. When we started this uh, uh, effort uh, three years ago, we were talking about Nissan Leafs and Volts, uh, and that was uh, uh, quite easy, very two different uh, vehicles, and already today we have uh, many, many more, and with very different performance, with very different uh, purchasing uh, motivation and very different usage patterns. Uh, we start with the minimum range uh, PHEVs. These are cars that people are buying in order to get better gas mileage. They're not driving them on electric. They're not getting a, an amazing a, a zero to 60. They're, they're getting better gas mileage. And, and that's the main motivation for these cars, except from other motivations we would talk about, like HOV stickers and so on. But, but that's w uh, what they are. Then we go for the more extended range cars. When people actually drive them as full electrics, many people are getting into the engine part of it only few times a month or even less than that or telling us that they're hardly visiting their gas station. And, and that's a different driving experience, a different motivation for purchase, and a different usage of the public infrastructure and chargers, as, as we will uh, see later. The, the new uh, uh, kind of uh, new idea, the new vehicle of the BEV-X, right now we have only one, the, the i3 Rex. And that's another new story for us. Is it a full EV that needs the public chargers as, as the Leaf and the i3, or is it a car that people will prefer to keep uh, driving home on gas and skip the DC fast charger, even so they can use it? And then we have the BVs and the range change and the charging speed change from 3.3 .3 to 6.6 .6 and so on. People can use more DC fast chargers than they used in the past. So. This is a big question for us, how much, how often, and so on. 
And on top of it, we have the very long range BEVs as the Tesla. And when we talk to a BEV driver today and we ask them, would you like a tour? What will you do with your 200 mile range? And of course, that I was expecting them to say, oh, either I don't need one or I will uh, drive further out. Some of the answers are pretty surprising. For example, someone said, oh, I'm willing to pay much more for a BEV 200 because then I will have to plug it only once a week. It's not driving more, it's just plugging in less, and that's a motivation. So there are different stories, depends on what kind of car we're talking, and that's what we are trying to bring into numbers later. Uh, the market changed pretty fast. This is numbers from 2014, and we already have newer ones from 2015. And as I said, it's a lot about the power, not just about a, a range. Range is only one factor. And uh, you see that people, the way they buy, the way they behave is very much correlated with the, po the potential to save, the price of electricity, the price of gas, but also the motivation to plug in, things like that. And we need to combine it all together. And I will not get into details here in the interest of time because I do have more, too many slides. <laughs> I just want to tell you why we are not getting into forecasting here. Uh, today we are a little bit in a better shape, it's, it's 2015, but in the last three or four years, we are 100% sure that the number of sales are not a good represent, representation of this point where demand and supply are meeting. We are not there yet. In order to have a market with demand and supply, you need to have a supply that will meet any, any demand, not just very few cars that the OEMs decide where and when and how much to sell. So right now we don't have this complete market that we can make good predictions about what will happen in the next couple of years. Actually, better predictions can be done, at least in the state of California, based on policies and requirements, for example, and not on market uh, supply and demand uh, uh, forecast. And we are using that, and that's probably the best numbers to use in the, in the model when we do uh, specific areas in, uh, in California. <clears throat> we do try to uh, look at the way it will get to the numbers that the regulator is trying, is trying to tell us together. And we are talking about the move from generation one to generation two of the vehicles. Today, we see how volt sales are dropping because everyone is waiting for uh, the sales of the Gen 2 volt in uh, the end of the year or in a couple of months. Uh, we haven't seen the Gen 2 of the Leaf, but we're expecting it just based on the same timing. Uh, we're expecting more longer range BEVs. Uh, and we see, we see the change happen. And uh, if you want to know more about that, I, I will uh, refer you to uh, Tom Torrentine's work, uh, uh, slides that are available online and, and other uh, papers and market uh, presentation that we have. So, okay, who is buying cars now? Who is buying PVs now? Who will buy PVs in, in the... In the future. That's the only slide I will have with projections, and that's very simple. What I did here is just extended the line. <laughs> no uh, econometric, nothing, it's just extending the lines. And if you're just extending the lines, you will get to um, 1 million cars on the road in, uh, 28, in 2018. And I think this is probably a reasonable uh, a number to, uh, to use, but we can uh, uh, use different numbers for different needs and different <coughs> regions in the state. And right now we're talking about sales that are about 50-50, PHEVs and BEVs, but that also can change uh, in the future. <coughs> First thing we need to remember is that new car buyers are not the general population. Regular cars.
Still, car buyers in, in California or in the U.S. or in general are not the general population. Uh, these are numbers from 2012 from the NHTS, uh, uh, from the Caltrans Travel Survey of 2012. So there were a couple of rough years in there uh, of, of uh, economy downtime and, and so on, economy down and so on. So back in 2012, two-thirds of the household did not purchase a new car in the last five years. We know today, based on Ken Coroni's work, that the number is lower. That I think it's about half. But still, when we sell new cars, we are not selling it to everyone in California. There are a third of the household that are potential market for any new car. And there is a small chunk in the market, about 7%, that buy about a third of the new cars, because they buy a new car every year or every other year. And in many cases, the top of this pyramid are more likely to buy their second plug-in car before someone at the bottom of the pyramid will buy their first one. So we are not talking about the entire population. And when we get to the model, we start with a model that tries to predict who are the new car buyers in general. And as you can see, it's mostly about income. Uh, this slide again shows very well the difference between the income, the average income of uh, regular ICE buyers, which peak around 100 to 150, versus hybrid buyers who have a little bit higher income. And then we have plug in buyers who have income of 200 plus. And if we will add Tesla to the story, we have people with income of 500 plus. We keep looking at it, and that's again something I'm telling you, the, mod, the, the tool right now is based on the data here. But we are starting a new survey today, I hope, <laughs> and maybe next month we'll be able to tell you that the average income of uh, PV owners in California actually dropped and it's similar or getting more similar to hybrids, and th these things are, are changing all the time. But we still have to remember Income of new car buyers is higher than the income of the average household, and income of plug-in buyers is higher than the average of new car buyer. So we have a subgroup with higher income. And I'm not expecting it to change dramatically. Uh, here, they, this is with the 500 numbers, and you can see how many of the uh, Tesla owners make uh, more, than a, more than half a million dollars a year per household. Another thing that we can see here is that the Leaf and the Tesla, we start to see how the market switch. When BV owners with very high income shift to different cars, BV owners with lower income shift to a, a stay on the Leaf, very high income, move to Tesla. I don't have i3s here, but I'm sure that we will see similar uh, uh, shifts there when the i3, which is technically very similar range and everything to the leaf will have different uh, 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 buyers. And we have a lot of people who did not answer, and you can put them wherever you want. I will put them probably on top of this 500 uh, in most cases. Now, where do they live? The kind of small dirty secret is that if you put the, num the where do they live on top of the income a map, you will get a very good correlation, but it's still not the entire story. Uh, it's a coastal story right now. It's the big metropolitan areas, and it's very much correlated with income. It's interesting to see that in some areas of the state, we already have many cars per, uh, uh, or like we have five cars per 100 households, or eight cars per 100 households, that's enough for you when you just travel to your street, go to uh, buy milk, and you will always see at least one or two or three cars if you know what you're looking for. And again, as Ken told us, many people just don't see them because they don't know that they are electric. The BV to PHEV distribution is very different than just this map of all plug-in cars together. Right now, we can see two or three different stories about who is buying full electric versus who is buying plug-in hybrids. Uh, LA region, it's a, the 
plug-in hybrid. You see red, and red is more plug-in hybrids, yellow is the 50-50, and green is more BEVs, full electric. In LA, the BEV 80s, they just don't have enough range. And we see more plug-in hybrids over there. Volts, Priuses, today the, the Ford, C-Max, and Fusion, and, and less BEV 80. The Teslas are a different story. In the Bay Area, it's the small map at the corner, we see more full electric around the higher income and shorter commute range. We see more uh, PHEVs who need to commute from further out. They have long commute and they can take advantage of the age of lanes better. And we see more PHEVs over there. San Diego is a full electric area. Uh, uh, unlike LA to the north. Uh, there are very interesting stories. There are full electric islands, as uh, San Luis Obispo, for example. So if you have a BV over there and it's not a Tesla, you are uh, most likely stay with your leaf over there and you're not traveling much north or south. Uh, and we keep following this market and trying to incorporate this distribution into the model. The way people travel, or the way what the, the needs is, is somewhat correlated with the decision to purchase one car or the other. We don't find a very good correlation of battery size of your PHEV, for example, with your commute distance. It's not working this way yet, but it's somewhat correlated. So if we look, look on one-way commute of the leaf, the red one here, it's the shortest, the Volt is a little bit longer, and the Prius is the longest with a long tail, which means that actually the smallest battery has the longest uh, commute. Uh, but if you calculate also the very good gas mileage, it may be a, a smart decision for the individual who, uh, who buy this car. So we are trying to correlate the commute distance, for example, with the vehicle people are buying, and we have here are the three cars we started with. And again, Leaf is changing the, changing the picture. Uh, not Leaf, sorry. Tesla is changing the picture. In some areas, Teslas are two-thirds of the BEVs. Uh, I don't need to tell you, but these areas are where more affluent households are. Uh, if, you, if you look here or if you check... Uh, uh, the areas around uh, LA. So it's a, it's a different story. It's very hard for us to model it, uh, but uh, it, the numbers are high enough that we need to try. Incentives are changing the story in, in a very strong way, but incentives also change fast. So if you plan something for 2020 or 2015, uh, age of East sticker may already be a history. So you need to think if you want to uh, uh, use it in, into the model. So carpool lanes, for example, in California, they're supposed to uh, expire in 2019. So if your forecasting horizon is up to 2019, there are big stories. Toyota Priuses in LA, two-thirds of them were purchased when HOV access was the primary motivation. And that's a 2014 survey. In the Bay Area, it's half of them. And in Sacramento, it's only a quarter. Uh, Volts also have strong impact of the, of the HOV access, but much lower than the Prius. And when we look at Nissan Leaf or other BVs, the impact of the HOV access is, is much lower, and then the location is, will, is not going to be skewed so much toward uh, uh, HOV. A lane. As you live further out from age of lane, and the, on the left here it's uh, miles from your age of lane, it's less likely to impact the decision to buy one plug-in over the other, and we have to take it into account. Uh, this is just the distribution of where do we see them now, and uh, it's not surprising. 
it's the Bay Area and uh, LA with, with much smaller numbers on uh, uh, Sacramento, for example. And let's uh, jump to other incentives, and this is just a little background about the about the decision of what what type of cars and when you will use the model or the tool, you need to decide how many VEVs, how many PHEVs of each category uh, uh, to uh, drop into the market, and this is kind of a background about it. We have one set of numbers, but you can use different sets of numbers. Um, so we had a big survey. This is actually outside of California, and we're doing California now. We'll have more results in the future. And this survey was uh, more than 4,000 cars. As expected, the income is still high, but it's lower than what we have seen in California. And this is just kind of a glimpse on the impact of different incentives. Red is high importance, blue is very low importance, and this uh, now it is a, a pie to the left are how many people see these incentives as applicable. So federal tax incentives on the top corner, every Nissan Leaf owner sees it's very important, 99% of them say it's applicable for them and it was a big story. With no, tech, with no federal tax incentives, Nissan Leaf, Chevy Volts will look very different. The market will look very different. Uh, I will not go over every one of these incentives here, but if we will jump to the non-monetary, workplace charging, for example, workplace charging and home charger subsidy are important for the PHEV 20s, for the Ford PHEV 20s, because they need charger all the time, and they have a battery big enough to take advantage of it. And we see that these guys say that it's uh, more important for them than uh, Priuses, for example, or Leafs and Volts. There are many more stories hidden in this table, but just we'll have to skip it and say, uh, you know, many of them said that the federal incentive, but it's not. The fact that it's important doesn't mean that they actually, or the fact that they will get a lot of money doesn't mean that it's always important. In this case, for example, Tesla guys, on the bottom we see how much money they get from these incentives, and all of them will get $7,500. They can take the maximum as a tax credit. But many of them said that it's not important. Some said it's somewhat important, that's about in the middle, and, and some said it's very important. But we have a big line of people who get the full amount but say it's not important. And in the California CVRP, we already see the change of not giving the money to people who will buy the car anyway. When we look on the leaf, we don't see this line of people who say it's not important. It's 7,500 for everyone, and it's important for everyone. And with the vault, we have a different story. We do have most of the people, and these are the red area here, very important, M7500. We have some people who said less important, and still they get a full amount of money. But we also see people who cannot take advantage of the full amount of money they will take home less than that. It may be income, it may be other tax liability, issues, but they will take less than that, it's still very important for them. So incentives and changing incentive will change the market in the future, and, and we can talk more about that. It's very much based on the income of buyers, and the income of buyers change. I will not go into a, a, this table right now, but this table shows the share of the incentive, not just the share of the price of the car, but also as share of their yearly income. And it changed dramatically based on how much the size of this uh, incentive and the average yearly income of this car buyer. So I think that I will stop here. Is it? Or do I talk about the, the tool now? Uh, I think not. Um, 
I think I go into workplace charging. Is that yeah. out of order? Okay, there we go. Oh, okay. So okay. Only one, <laughs> one slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, I will take questions yeah. now. The conference has been unmuted. You're in the room, or um, will you be beginning to start tracking used electric vehicle vehicle sales? Yes, uh, ARB uh, uh, sponsored a new study that we're just starting on used electric vehicle sales, and we're going to have a survey soon. Uh, they, there is also another component of looking on the all sale market. Uh, so it's just starting, so it's going to take a while, but I think that by the end of the year, early next year, we'll start to actually have results that show it. We believe that already we have about 5,000, maybe more, use uh, PV owners in California, so it, it's getting to, we touch seeing it on the radar now. And then as a sub to that, are you also going to start tracking uh, battery replacement statistics, sales of replacement batteries and then repurposing them? Um, not as part of what we are doing here. ITS in general have some studies about it. We had a big study in the past about repurposing batteries. Uh, but not as part of this project or similar projects. Thank you. Uh, there is uh, incentive and oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, please. No, please go ahead. No, 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 no. Already started. I'm now. sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> go. Please go ahead. Uh, there is incentive and benefit. Uh, for example, uh, when the company, uh, as for example BMW, as such for the clients, uh, are you buy your car two years after use? Uh, is a, a company is give not a government. The company is give us some some benefits for the clients. Do you consider in your study, study this situation when the company gives some? Can we, you repeat the question? We, so the question is if I consider the the incentive that the company is giving and not just a federal incentive. So we are not considering it directly, but we ask. The exact cost, the exact price that people were paying for the car. So we are not using just the MSRP. We have the MSRP, but we also use, ask people how much did you pay. And, and if people are leasing the car, we ask them what was your down payment, uh, how much is your monthly payment, what is the length of your lease, and so on. So we are trying to capture the actual price they pay, not just the MSRP. So if there are any incentives there, uh, I hope that we uh, capture them all. Um, in one of your slides uh, regarding the, um, tax, uh, the federal tax incentive, um, some people stated that they got $10,000 income tax incentive. Uh, Is uh, that based on a misunderstanding? Or yeah, we're dealing with people, so we always have errors. Okay. That's part of it. Uh, another part is, and some of the errors are people who combine into this question other incentives that they had. Okay. And then I can see, because we did separate this, federal, the state, and the local incentives, but some people combine them together. Okay. So and they didn't really qualify for a $10,000 income tax incentive? Uh, no, but let's say it in the, in the other way. If that's what they wrote in their uh, tax uh, uh, papers, they will get $10,000. Uh, so, you know, if you're not being audited, you can get whatever number you put in your tax <laughs> So and we see that too as part as part of. Just the curious about the ten thousand dollar tax. I haven't shown you that the the four thousand dollar incentive. There are many people there who who were writing seventy five hundred. Okay. And that's that. It it is a problem in a, in a way. It may be perceived. No, it's also people who actually use the 75. I have some evidence for that. When they lease the car. When they lease the car and still ask for the money and so on. But I, uh, is there anyone from the IRS online? No, well, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, any questions uh, online? Do you see any hands up? Uh, I don't have any typed questions. Uh, the, the, I have a question here, Cliff Hitzi from BMW. Uh, can we get the, the presentation and the data? The presentation, for sure. The, the, the data, <laughs> I, I'm not sure which, which data uh, you're talking about, but the presentation. No, the presentation we have seen. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, that will be available. Yeah, and okay. then we and we have more uh, papers and reports behind the presentation that uh, are available. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay so. Any uh, 
Mike. The conference has been muted.